in regards to potential and what we can achieve as humans, we can we can travel the entire universe as humans physically and i'm not just saying this in like some imaginary things a human has the potential to travel the entire universe someday and literally see it with its eyes and feel it with its body but <laughs> the nature in which we have been built the nature of human and i think that's one of the things that is not being talked about because we we talk a lot about nature of reality but we don't talk about nature of human the nature of consciousness is such that and there's a joke in it in in, in iran about it is such that if i give you if i give you a corporate office and i worked in a corporate office before in a six by six cubicle if i give you a corporate office six by six cubicle after a year you want a 24 by 24 office. And so you work your you work your way up and you you tell yourself, oh, that's my potential. You know, I I can achieve that. I can get there. And you get there after about a year, year and a half there, then you want a corner office. You want an office with a view and you're like, I I have I have the potential. I can do it. And you go there. You get the, the corner office. And then after a year and a half, two years there, you want the the CEO office. You want to be at the top level, the C C suite, and so on and so forth. And the joke in it in Farsi is that um, there was a guy who just wanted to know what's going to happen with the world. He wanted to know what's going to happen with the world, and he wanted to know what's happening in the world right now. And um, he was very nosy and he was very greedy. And so a lot of people, oh, the whole planet got together and they said that because they were pretty annoying. He, he was annoying the shit out of them. And they, were, they got together and they said, hey, if we give you half of the world, you get half of the world. Will you stop bothering us about what's going on and wanting this and knowing that? And then he said, yes, but what are you going to do with the other half? <laughs> and so. This is the nature of us as humans, wherever you're going to reach in the physical realm, wherever you're going to get to in the physical realm, there will always be something greater because it's infinite. But when that focus, that same intent and attention is focused on the nature of who you are, on exploring the nature of what you are, then that I see as reaching your full potential. And the way that I understand that is each individual has a certain capacity to experience and understand that intelligence that we call God in a day to day life. And that is human potential. To the point where if you can, for example, if my capacity to understand God is this cup, once this is full, then there, there is nowhere for me to go. There is nothing for me to do. I am blissed out daily because I focused my potential on my capacity to understand the nature of who I am. So today I had on my friend Hutan on the podcast, and I met Hutan in a men's group called The Fellowship, ran by my friend Eisen, who is also a guest on the podcast. And we just hit it off because we both love talking about philosophy and religion and getting deep into the different aspects of it. And he has so much knowledge when it comes to it. And so that's what we talked about today, many different aspects of that, from Sufism to the deep psychological aspects of ego, and then how people like David Goggins and... The Tates use this aspect and how close to truth really is it? And there are many other topics that we covered as well. Check out the bookmarks for all those different topics. And without further ado, let's get into it. You were talking about how you, my interpretation of it was that the ego doesn't exist in your worldview. What do you think about that? Mm. 
Well, first of all, man, thank you for having me on. Yeah. It's interesting. Sure. So your interpretation of what I said was that the ego, uh, what my perception is that the ego doesn't exist. Yeah. Mm. Is that wrong? Mm. If it is wrong, then that's good. Cause tell me. <laughs> oh, that's pretty interesting. Um, no, I believe the ego exists. Uh, I, I just feel like I have a different definition of it than what's currently out there and what's the current perception of it. And the and to have a little context um in the group chat it was talked about and i see this happen a lot you know when something happens when someone messes up or when we want to name something and place a cause on something for example we're looking at the world right now and we're like Oh, it's the man's ego that's creating this. So we're looking to place a cause as to the effect of what's happening. I'm seeing that as a, a separation. Like it's a disconnection there because we're essentially saying that I'm not doing it. Something outside of me, something next to me is doing that. And in that separation between the I and my ego, this fragmentation is exactly where we can be infiltrated by the system. It's exactly where we can be um, cut off. And so what I was saying is that to truly own, to truly take ownership and responsibility and freedom is to not place the cause on the ego per se, but place the cause on me. I am doing this. Ego, in my perception, is the container is the vehicle through which i can see myself and it's not so much that the ego is doing it the ego is showing who i am it's showing the content inside and the example that i brought up is you and i both used to be over 300 pounds and that's something that we can get into so if when i was back over uh, 300 pounds if in the same analogy, if I were to always say my ego was doing that, my ego is doing this, it would be saying if my spoon made me fat, you know, my fork made me fat, my plate made me fat. In that same analogy, the way that I see the ego is it's a, it's a vehicle, it's a tool. It's a way for us to see the content inside of ourselves. And so being able to take that ownership that I am doing it, I believe gives us a lot of power, freedom, and ability, choices to really shift our experience of reality. Hmm. So tell me if, with that definition, if you agree with this. Sometimes I describe it as like Siri, where there's like an auto-suggestion going on constantly. And it's not the thing causing it, but we're agreeing to the suggestions it has. So I think what you're making is like this jump to then say, it's not actually the ego, it's us agreeing to it. And so it's showing us that aspect where we're agreeing to what it wants particularly. And I think that just comes down to the human mind and mm -hmm. these primitive drives that we have. We can call it the ego. It's like these... um you know, they call it in the Bible, right? The seven deadly sins. They talk about it in the Bhagavad Gita, Yogananda translation. I think it's this, there, there's six of them, but it's the same concept that there's these core functions of essentially the body. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's just really important to have that distinction as, yeah, you're agreeing to it, though. It's not like... <laughs> It's doing it and you have no control. You had control. It's like you weren't at the driving. You weren't driving. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it's driving for you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the, the ego is the vehicle through which you're able to see what's driving. It's just a machine. It's a complex machine. And uh, the word ego in the Farsi language... And I love how much you're into studying religion. The word for ego in the Farsi language is nafs. 
and nafs literally translates to self. So the way that the ego is seen in that tradition, in that ancient wisdom, is that the ego is showing you yourself. It's not causing anything because you're the ultimate cause of your experience of reality. The ego is through the wish that you can see what's happening. So would you say that any action then is ego? No, any action is you. Okay. <laughs> any action is you. And because the you in in essence is you and I, in essence, we are impermanent. And what do I mean by that? There is no solid form to it. There is no solid sense of self. Because how can it be? Even our bodies are ever-changing. I mean, from the time that we sit, sat down to, to now, we've changed. And so we don't have a solid sense of self. And because that can be very hard to grasp, that can be very hard to understand, we've just named it as the ego and we've named it as something to place on. And I think that's one of the things that has to be cleared up in the consciousness of the collective if we want to really take our power back. Hmm. Yeah, I see the self as this unchanging, you could say, Tao would be an mm. interesting way to put it. It's like, it's the mystery. It's the, the mother of 10,000 things, they call it in Taoism. And so the self would be nothing that has form because when you have form, it's limited. So when you have if your true nature is unlimited, then every time you limit it, it can't be it fully, but it can be it for now. So that's what you're saying, right? With chain being the fundamental essence. But for me, I think the distinction is, is that the self can't be anything physical. So then that form would be, um, it would never be self, truly. We couldn't call anything in the form, even the ego self, if what we truly are is infinity or the mystery or formlessness or the fucking quantum field is what they're calling it nowadays sometimes, <laughs> right? But mm -hmm. that's an interesting distinction. So th this naturally takes me to God then, right? So mm -hmm. what's your view on God? How do you, how do you see God? This is another concept and another point where on a collective level, it's shifting so massively. So I'm a big fan of words. You know, when I want to understand concepts, when I get into the modes of philosophy, I use words and I study words and I go to the root words of where did this word come from? Why is this word being used for this concept? And so in the Farsi language, the word for God is Choda. And Choda is a combination of two words, Chod and A. So Chod means self. And A means greater self or bigger self or all-encompassing self. Not or, I'm sorry, and. And ultimately the mirror of self. And so in the and i'll keep coming back to farsi because i was born in iran and i grew up there until i was 11 and moved to the u.s when i was um, 11 like i said and so the way that i experience god the way that i see god i go back to that word choda that it is god is me and it is the mirror of me God is my higher self, and it is the intelligence that is pervading all of it. God is my greater self, and it is everything that is surrounding me. It is every atom. It is every molecule. It is every single thing in this physical and non-physical existence. And that's the way that I see and experience God. 
Woo! I feel like that's on point. I can't, I don't even think I could say it better. Yeah, I completely agree. What do you think about the Western view of God as being the man in the sky? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I grew up in a household that God was a man in the sky too, and still is, you know, that's deep in the collective unconscious that God is somewhere up in the sky and is going to come down and save all of us. Um, and that's another thing where it's so interesting. The word choda um, in Farsi is genderless. There is no gender for that word. And so that's another thing in the West where he is placed on God. The pronoun he is placed. And you can imagine what can that what that can do in the collective unconscious in regards to relating with this intelligence that we call God, what we call source, and we call universe. And so um, it's just been a lot of, uh, the way that I see it is that there's been a lot of placing, make, making man as God right now. You know, the way that society is built, especially in the West, is that man is God. And women is built to please that God. Women is built to serve that God. Women is built to um, take care of this God, which is quote unquote man. And so that's the way that it's been like in the West. And I think it's really important to come back to this truth that God is genderless. And because of lack of um, absence of language, he is used and so that's that can be very dangerous when it comes to um really understanding that essence really understanding that intelligence and also how triggering just the word god is right now how just the word itself can incite a lot of frustration and annoyance and even hate and resentment and so i think that all goes back to um one God not being seen as self, and two, God is being placed uh, as like a he or a man in the sky. And those are the two things, one with many things that has to be cleared up in the collective conscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that thought, you're saying that there's a lot of man, manizing God. Mm -hmm. I guess if that's a word. <laughs> what do you think the solution is to that? Well, there is no quick fix. This is going to take time. Um, there is no quick fix solution for it. But ultimately, man must come down to earth. Because right now, inside of, inside of you and me, there is an identity that thinks it's above. That thinks it's above the rest of creation. And that has to die. And so, man, and I'm talking about not human, man, has to come down to earth. Has to be as humble as the dirt. Has to recognize its tininess in this grand scheme. And that is not going to be an overnight solution because that which in us wants to be God and is acting like God in our households, in our jobs, in our corporations, in our world, is so strong. It is so powerful. And that, that, Identity inside of man needs to die. So when you're saying that God has this identity within man of being God, how do you think that plays out? The know-it-all. How many, how, how, how many times do we act as a know-it-all? And we talk about the Savior, right? Um, the, uh, one, the two things that I believe it shows up in our day-to-day -day life as a man is 
One, we've derived our sense of confidence and self-esteem on being better than you. Just think about, I mean, we go, we're both athletes too. How much was our sense of worth and confidence on dominating someone else? And so that roots back to me believing that I have to be better than you. I have to be above you. And second thing, the savior. And this is something that is not being talked about when it comes to the savior and the pleaser is that in order for someone to be the savior, in order for someone to believe that they're to please and to save, they must on some level believe that they know it all and they know what's best for you and they know what you need in this moment. And so that is how it's showing up. The, the savior, the pleaser, and the competitor, the, the one that feels threatened by another man's presence, the, the one that feels threatened by another man's gift and wisdom and um, bigness. Those are the two things that needs to die inside of a man. Okay, so that's an interesting point because right now you're seeing a lot of the Andrew Tates of the world who are saying, get to the top of the hierarchy, right? <laughs> you got to get to the top. You got to make money. You got to do these things so you can be proud of yourself. And that's mm. pretty much a direct quote. So when you see that, he's seeing that as extremely valuable as a man. You're saying it's not valuable. I'm, 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 link, I'm linking that, right? That's what I'm, I'm yeah. trying to make that link because I think a lot of people are going to wonder. No, that's a great point. And I'm very much into mysticism, which essentially um, means getting into a day-to-day real-life experience with that intelligence that we call God. And so in mysticism, what one of the things that you're able to cultivate is clear seeing, being able to see clearly. And so someone like Andrew Tate, <laughs> um, one must be in a severely dark place inside of themselves to want to get to the top of the chain just so that they can feel better about themselves. That man must be in such pain, in such fear, in such emptiness inside of himself that the only thing that will fill that or make himself feel better is for him to be on top of the world. That's a pretty dark place to be inside of yourself. Yeah, I think the devil's advocate there is that he's also talking about do it for your family, you know, being able to provide all these things. And so I, I'm not sure if it's like a only, but that's definitely one of the driving forces. And I feel like if I'm looking at the levels of consciousness, that that's kind of a step up, being proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. is a step up from being ashamed of yourself. So it's almost like there's levels to this shit. And he might mm -hmm. be getting people from, I said this a year ago, I think. He's getting people from like zero to 20 is where they're at, um, to maybe... 190 on out of a thousand or 200 and it's just arbitrary numbers but i'm saying it's like not it's not to the upper levels of truth if truth is relative to how close you are to unity but mm -hmm. it's a little bit closer than complete rejection of self to be proud of self you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can you elaborate on that yeah so if the lowest level of consciousness is shame, where you reject your own self and you're something literally wrong with you, to go from that to move kind of up the levels to then say, okay, I'm doing things and I'm proud of what I'm doing, you're not rejecting yourself because the biggest lie is that there's something wrong with you inherently, mm -hmm. that you're imperfect, that you were born into sin, whatever it might be, that you made error, yada, yada. And so, the step up from shame is guilt, guilt being that you just did something wrong versus there's something literally wrong with you. And mm -hmm. so as you go up, if you're in these, this place and he's like, get yourself together, you're a piece of shit, but you, you can do better. 
<laughs> then it's getting you to the place you're like, okay, well, I, I did do better. Now I feel good about myself. I don't think there's something necessarily wrong with me anymore. But now I'm just in this paradigm of I need to prove I'm, I'm more powerful, but yet I'm not seeing the humility or the courage or th these types of things. So I almost feel mm. like there's different voices for different levels of consciousness in that if you're coming up, that's still needed for a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of people that need that. And another example of it would be, I think David Goggins is riding the line too. Mm -hmm. He was talking about similar things in like getting hard and like, don't be a piece of shit. Get the fuck up. Let's mm -hmm. go. So that's kind of getting you up there. But it, you see, I think that there's so, this is my overall point here. Some people are so far away from love and from connecting to God that they need to make that that slow mm -hmm. that slow progression like you said it's not going to be an instant so it's like the stairway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a great point because you're right we need the david goggins and the andrew tates of the world we need them and for multiple reasons one like the reason that you mentioned uh a person, I, if I were to look at back at myself when I was 25 and 24, the way that I was lo living life and the way that I was looking at life, I would not have made the jump like that from 24 or 25 to where my conscious is not right now. And so people are like David Goggins and Andrew Tate are needed for this planet for the um, evolutionary ladder of consciousness. And two, the second reason why they're needed is that we need contrast. We need contrast in this world. If there was no darkness, light would not be distinguished. And so if there were no Andrew Gog uh, Tate and David Coggins Andrew of the Gog world. <laughs> 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 yeah, let's combine them. If there were no Andrew Goggins in the world, then there would be no Jesus of the world. There would be no. Um, Whoever else that you right now think is uh, embodying unity consciousness, embodying truth consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that I, I really, and that's, that's the, what you're talking about and what we're talking about. In essence, it's, exact, it's exactly what, uh, how the, one of the things that inside of man needs to die is this, that can we exist without feeling threatened by the presence of other men, no matter where they are? Can we be ex inclusive? Can we be an ocean that receives all streams? And this is the task that I feel like as men, we are here to embody within ourselves is that, yes, David Goggins is here and Andrew Tate is here and no matter where they are in their level of consciousness, they're needed and their presence does not threaten my existence. Mm -hmm. And I know there's going to be people that are pissed because putting them in the same category. They're like, they're not the same. <laughs> I can fucking see the comments already. <laughs> but I think the important point here is that I think the other interpretation some people might have of what we're saying is that they're at a low level as if they're worse. When an important point that I made there is if truth, I think this is an important, if truth is defined relatively by how close it is to unity, unity being absolute truth, that being um, just as though you would think about a wavelength, how it gets closer together, closer together, closer together. And ab at, at, at a point, you're infinitely fast and infinitely slow at the same time, paradoxically. And that being the truth is that when you're connected in that way. And you can say when you feel love, you're actually just feeling mo the wavelengths, the frequencies of this experience being closer together. So when, we, when I'm making this point, it's not about that he's worse. It's that if we're looking at it kind of in a scientific way, there's frequencies that are faster and slower and his might be a little bit slower, but if humanity is really stuck really low, 
then at some points in history, you might need that specific voice more, not necessarily more than, but just as much as you would need the higher frequencies of the Jesus and the Buddha, because there's different, there's par- different paradigms here. Because yeah. you could say the Jesus, the Buddha, um, Muhammad, they're all relaying different um, energy. Energy. It's more energy based. It's it's words, yes. But if you think about it, if they're at a specific frequency, the frequency might be the thing that lifts people up. And the thing that I've noticed is that when you have like the tapes, it's not necessarily just. It's not about the frequency. Sometimes it's about more the way they're saying things that makes it more relatable to people versus Mm -hmm. people that are outside religion or outside of spirituality. It doesn't feel relatable. It doesn't feel like graspable at all. And they might reach a point where they they reach a level of suffering to where they realize I I want to dive into this arena. But I think right now the outside religion voices can be really, really beneficial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> man the current landscape of religion today is a mess and at the same time it is perfection <laughs> <It's a paradox. laughs> um i the way that the way that i see it you know the way that <clears throat> i would tell anybody because essentially let's Fundamentally, what David Goggins and Andrew Tate are doing for the world and for people is they are coming with a prescription as to if you do this, this will happen, essentially. And what they are wanting to do for people is for people to feel better about themselves. For with David Goggins being through exercise and mindset work, which we both have done as people over 300 pounds losing a lot of weight, and uh, Andrew Tate and all the things that he's doing. So essentially, they're trying to uh, bring about some sort of pleasantness for people within themselves. And what I would say is that that original unpleasantness that it's in society, if, if someone is Uh, 300 pounds and if someone is broke the reason why they feel unpleasant is because from from birth we have been taught to compare we have been taught to compete we have been taught to be like each other and that's in school and that's in the house and so that if that's the cause of the original person, the original unpleasantness that could be shame, fear, stress, anxiety. If that's the cause, then we cannot use the same method for someone to feel better about themselves because all you're doing is you're essentially using the same method of, well, I, I right now and don't feel good about myself because I'm comparing myself to someone else. And so we're, we're using the same thing that is causing that unpleasantness to create pleasantness, and that will never work because people like David Goggins and Andrew Tate will never feel enough because as long as you place anything outside of yourself, as long as you place any sense of worth outside of yourself, that I feel good about myself because I have this and someone else doesn't, That inherently says you don't feel enough. That inherently says that your self-esteem is pretty low. And so that's what I would say is everything must happen inward. Everything must be inward. True confidence is confidence that is brewing from the inside. Nothing that you can sense from the people around you or where you find yourself in life. And that's that's pretty important to become clear on and the world around self and the talk about self-esteem and confidence and um, wanting to feel better about yourself as a human. Ooh. Okay. I don't even know if I'm keenly aware if the languaging that they use around being 
is it um, is it really around being better than other people? Andrew Tate, I'm pretty sure more. I'm not sure if David Goggins, if that's true. Um, it may be more about just being the best you can be. And so that the next question is naturally, how do you see competing against yourself? So the reason why I say David Goggins is also the has this I'm better than you is because just the whole conversation as the best you can be. You know, best in relation to what? You know, the, anything, any sort of conversation of best version of yourself, be the better version of yourself, be the true version of yourself. We're saying that in a context to relation to something else. And so this whole notion of be the best version that you can be, if you were the only person on the planet, would that even be a thought in your mind? <laughs> would that be even be something that you would think about? No, because there's nothing in relation to. Well, maybe. And so here's the here's the devil's advocate. Maybe because what if you're realizing you could, if you were just the only person on the planet, you would still be like, I can sit here and be lazy. I can I can just chill and do nothing. I can let myself mm -hmm. die, mm -hmm. or I can go out, build a fire. I can go out, do the best that I can. Mm -hmm. And to to bring it back to the best you can be. If you're comparing yourself not to other people, but the previous version of you and seeing the goal being the highest human potential, for example. You cut I, off there a little bit. If you're okay. comparing yourself. Yeah, if you're if you're comparing yourself to the version of you that was late, like for me, I was 315 pounds that was lazy, that was depressed, and I'm saying, I want to be the best that I can be. What if the standard is not in relation to other people, but it's in re relation to me studying what the highest human potential could be and mm -hmm. then chasing after that? For example, I've recently committed to training for a triathlon, and that's mm. not necessarily has any, it doesn't have anything to do with other people. It has to do with me challenging myself to push myself to the limits of what the human potential is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you bringing this up because what I'm saying inherently, you wanting to be the best version of yourself, you wanting to reach your potential is not inherently wrong. That's actually something that is built in into the consciousness built into the soul. What I am talking about is the driving force. What I'm talking about is what we are using to do that. And the the way that I would say is, and you ask me if what what do I think about comparison in regards to myself? And I had this um I had this thought I think about a year ago. And I'm like, why am I even comparing myself to myself? Why why am I comparing? in the first place what why am i using this as fuel for motivation and i started getting into this mindset of if i were the only person on the planet would i be comparing would i be competing and i realized that it's a we're, we're using our limbic brain that's a thought process from a limbic brain and when the fear there is gone when the stress is gone, then we don't even think like that anymore. When the new cortex is on, we don't even think like that anymore. And this is what I mean. The, the need for me to compare myself, even to myself, stems from me thinking that I have to be someone else in order to feel worthy of love. It stems from me believing that if I don't get anywhere else, if I don't become a better person, if I don't become a best version of myself, then I'm not worthy of love. And that's when we get into comparison, even with ourselves. But when that part of the mind, with that activity of the mind, is seen clearly and observed clearly, and the emotions that are cleared, 
then the individual can feel worthy of love now. And with that level of acceptance, there is no comparison, not even with yourself, because then you're inspired to do something. You're, you're pulled to do something. And so this is, I want to make this distinction. It's about push and pull. It's about how are you, what are you using to motivate? And right now in, in the planet right now, it's a lot of push. And so with acceptance, with love, you feel naturally pulled and naturally inspired to um, reach for your potential. And the beauty of that, the beauty of that is that you're not placing your worth on that. And when you're not placing your worth on that, you're, you're, you can travel that in a day or two. You can travel the path of reaching your potential in, in a matter of seconds because you're, and that's another thing, reaching your potential is not a physical thing. It's a level of consciousness. Reaching your potential is the ability for you to expand your capacity to take in this mystery and to experience it. And that you can do in a couple of minutes <laughs> if you have a good guy with you. But I feel like if your potential is there as a means as of an abstract point of uh, future in regards to once I get there, then I feel worthy and complete. Um, then there's going to be a lot of pushing. There's going to be a lot of comparison. And that's what I mean, that even if you get there, even if you get to your potential, you're still not going to feel complete because the way that you got there, it's all about comparison. It's all about um, feeling unworthy. It's all about pushing yourself. And that process is going to be there with you. And this, you, can, you can be on top of the world, but that, that identity inside of you is going to still be there and you're going to be feeling miserable. Interesting. Okay. So with that specific point of reaching your potential versus comparing yourself, mm -hmm. I want to get really clear on the difference between those. And can you, can you do both at the same time without putting yourself worth on the line? I don't even mean for that to fucking rhyme, but it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a great question. And in regards to self-worth, one of the thing, one the, the thing that we are being tasked as, as humans on the planet right now is to feel worthy by simply existing, is to feel worthy by simply being, and you just froze and I don't know if you can hear You're me. You're good. I can hear you now. You're good. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so in essence, I think, I think and this is coming to me now, is that being able to really fulfill our potential is to uh, this is this is a really interesting question because what what is potential right now in in our minds? you know it, right now, when you look at when you think about potential. When you think about your potential, what comes to your mind? What what image do you see that see, you it, are that's walking the, it, towards? That's it, right? Because in order to see potential, you have to compare to what other humans are doing. Mm -hmm. But I don't mm -hmm. think that necessarily means that it has to take off your self-worth in order to compare. I think that's where we differ because I can compare to my past self, understand that that past self did the best that it could and still say that i am reaching my potential in this moment which to answer your question to me looks like being completely present and as connected as i can to what i feel inspired by you could say god source spirit whatever it might be to share not based on some arbitrary measure of success given mm -hmm. by someone else but mm -hmm. but rather letting go of the past and saying if i'm here if i look at not necessarily a particular human but what humans are capable of right now which mm -hmm. you know it is what it is i was obese 
and most majority of Americans are obese, um, mm -hmm. addicted to their phones. And it's, if I can see that as not a bad thing, but I can just say, this is what the lower levels of human potential are. What is the inverse of that? What is the mm -hmm. closest to light I can move? I feel like mm. sometimes you, it's almost like you need a level of ego in there. And I remember having a conversation with Eisen about this, that in order to have his relationship work sometimes, it was about having a level of ego involved. So it, I don't think it, it's necessarily a bad thing either, but it's as though the collective has like literally expansion packs that they're playing and levels that you're playing. Mm-hmm. You, it's almost like you use a higher, a higher mind to let go of the lower mind, the primitive aspects. That's what we're talking about the, the the survival mechanisms. Which a whole nother conversation is like the the geopolitical ramifications of having no hierarchies. Because if you have mm -hmm. no hierarchies, what do you do? Because are you saying <laughs> communism? And because does communism work? I don't think so. And so that's a that's a difficult one because it also depends on the context of what we're talking about. If we're talking about reaching your potential or we're talking about running a society. Because I mm -hmm. think you can have different answers for different uh categories. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. And you said a couple of things that I would like to touch on. Um well one thing that it's really important to know is that a lot of the a lot of systems that truly work that are here for our service have been um, distorted and convoluted in our minds. One example being communism. I'm not saying communism works and it's the way to go. I'm just saying that that principle in which we are to live in harmony with each other has been the convoluted and distorted in our minds, in our minds with communism. To the point that if anything remotely is close to that, we're like, no, 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 that doesn't work. And so just want to point that out that the way that this system it is continuing to keep its power on us is by operating one or two notches underneath the truth and putting on this show and putting on this like image that we are embodying truth when they're only like a couple of notches down. So that's one thing. Um, in regards to potential and what we can achieve as humans, we can, we can travel the entire universe as humans physically. And I'm not just saying this in like some imaginary things. A human has the potential to travel the entire universe someday and literally see it with its eyes and feel it with its body. But <laughs> the nature in which we have been built, the nature of human, and I think that's one of the things that is not being talked about because we, we talk a lot about nature of reality, but we don't talk about nature of human, the nature of consciousness, is such that, and there's a joke <laughs> in it in, in, in Iran about it, is such that if I give you if I give you a corporate office, and I worked in a corporate office before in a six by six cubicle, if I give you a corporate office, six by six cubicle, after a year, you want a 24 by 24 office. And so you work your, you work your way up and you, you tell yourself, oh, that's my potential. You know, I, I can achieve that. I can get there. And you get there after about a year, year and a half there, then you want a corner office. You want an office with a view and you're like, I, I have I have the potential. I can do it. And you go there. You get the, the corner office. And then after a year and a half, two years there, you want the the CEO office. You want to be at the top level, the C C suite, and so on and so forth. And the joke in it in Farsi is that um there was a guy who just wanted to know what's gonna happen with the world. He wanted to know what's going to happen with the world, and he wanted to know what's happening in the world right now. And um, he was very nosy, and he was very greedy. And so a lot of people, oh, the whole planet got together, and they said that, because they were pretty annoying. He, he was annoying the shit out of them. And they, were, they got together, and they said, hey, 
If we give you half of the world, you get half of the world. Will you stop bothering us about what's going on and wanting this and knowing that? And then he said, yes, but what are you going to do with the other half? (laughs) And so this is the nature of us as humans. Wherever you're going to reach in the physical realm, wherever you're going to get to in the physical realm, there will always be something greater because it's infinite. But when that focus, that same intent and attention is focused on the nature of who you are, on exploring the nature of what you are, then that I see as reaching your full potential. And the way that I understand that is each individual has a certain capacity to experience and understand that intelligence that we call God in a day-to-day life. And that is human potential to the point where if you can, for example, if my capacity to understand God is this cup, once this is full, then there, there is nowhere for me to go. There is nothing for me to do. I am blissed out daily because I focused my potential on my capacity to understand the nature of who I am. And there it is. And there it is. Wow. So, very interesting story. When you're saying reach your potential, then to you it means kind of similar to what I was saying, correct me if I'm wrong, in the present yes. moment? Connected? Yeah. So, in other words, this is another way that I understand God. In this physical realm, um, and I'm going to use um, in this analogy, we, we use our minds to understand things. And the heart is, and I think that's one of the things that um, is out there right now as well. When we say the heart, it's a metaphorical, it's a symbolism. When we say speak from the heart, talk from the heart, live from the heart, it's a it's a symbology because we're essentially what we're do what we're talking about is live with love, live with compassion, live with mercy, live with forgiveness, live with peace and harmony. But that's all the mind. That's the that's the inherent nature of the mind. But in order to make it poetic, we use the word heart. So the way that I see it is the the thing that is created by this intelligence cannot be used to understand the same that said intelligence meaning the mind that was created by god cannot be used to understand the reality of god it's impossible it would be like the ai will never get to a place to understand human because ai was created by human and so whatever is created by, by you will never have the capacity to understand the nature of who you are. And I know we're going to get into AI. We might get into AI in this conversation and the world is going to buzz with robots and AI. But AI will never be able to grasp the nature of what it means to be a human, no matter how advanced it will get. And so similarly, human will never be able to grasp the nature of God in this physical realm. Not in a sense of forever, in this physical realm, because we don't have the tools. We have limited tools. And so in this physical realm, how can we understand God? How can we uh, experience God? And the way that I see it in regards to potential is that We understand and relate to God through the names and qualities and attributes of that intelligence. 
And what are the attributes and qualities of that intelligence? Love, forgiveness, compassion, mercy, peace, harmony, generosity. And so that I see as full potential. That's that I see as um, then exploring the nature of who I am in my ability to embody those qualities, to cultivate all of those uh, potentialities that are already in me and to bring them out, to manifest them, to shine them out. That is what I see as reaching my full potential. I'm sitting with that one for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel as though there's many different systems. I've talked about that. I feel like what you're describing reminds me of the tree of life. And it's mm. the different attributes that they have. Mm. Emanations. Oh, tell me more about that. Have you seen have you seen the tree of life before? I've it's been coming into my experience and existence a lot recently, but I have not dove into it. All right. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to see if I can find it. It's going to take me a break. So, okay, <laughs> this is kind of funny how this works, <laughs> but I'm about to pull up an Amazon. There's something on Amazon that I found an image of <laughs> that actually is a really good description. So shout out to you, whoever made this. We're just gonna <laughs> we're gonna promote you here. I'm gonna so I can I think I can share a screen right here. Um, uh, here we go. Okay, can you see this? It's um, it's loading. Okay. Hopefully, it'll show up. Maybe. What What did you search? I can pull it up on my end. Hold on. Oh, it's oh. showing up. Okay. I can so see look, it now. Look at this thing, right? So, it's like if when you're looking at the tree of life. For those that are on audio, this is going to be a little bit difficult. There's different names of god and they all have there's different qualities and they all relate to uh different elements and it's it's actually a very complex system i don't even pretend to be an expert i'm actually a scrub uh, when it comes to this <laughs> but the what i was pointing to is that for example you look at hold and that's glory and honor it's an aspect and it's literally what you're saying right and you have hey Nick, you you cut off a little bit right there after okay. saying you're a scrub, which I <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you look here, for example, you look at Keither at the top. Um, it's Arch Archangel Metatron is what it's referring to, and it's talking about the crown as well, um, which is kind of hard. That one's a little bit harder to understand. We'll talk about uh, see Bina here, uh, the attribute would be understanding and you have Gabuda mm. here and the attribute is justice and fear so what i what i'm saying is that i'm not an expert but when you're <laughs> talking about the names of god and you're talking about the attributes this is what immediately came to mind and mm. for example it says the 10 spheres plus the 22 paths equal the 32 paths of wisdom. Because basically what, what you're saying is that it's hard, really hard for me to point this out, but you can like go this way and this way, this mm -hmm. way, this way, this way, this way. So mm -hmm. the, it's just, um, it's one way to think about it. And the other way that was uh, kind of coming to me was hinduism this is a actually a different topic but it's well no it's the same topic but a different way to think about it the different aspects of god being represented as gods themselves mm. mm -hmm. 
so you might have the goddess of war. You might have mm. the um, god of wisdom. You might have this and that. And they all actually have, they're actually deities. And I think that's interesting. A question that I've always contemplated is in the West, there basically is just God in Christianity, mm. let's say. I mean, there's the Trinity, God, Father, Holy Spirit. But essentially, one dude dictating it all. And to mm-hmm. me, when I started to study Hinduism, it actually made a lot more sense that there were these different aspects of God that were actually incarnated beings. And it was like a a top down a top down system in the same way that Alan Watts used to say that true I think it was true wisdom is the delegation of authority and Mm -hmm. true trust is the delegation of authority and so I wonder if creation this is just my own speculation that creation is kind of like this galactic mind that being the mind of God then creates like a galactic mind literal galaxy that has a mind Mm -hmm. and then that has its own experiments that has its own gods, its own way of working, its own emanations, maybe its own attributes. And I wonder if it's different in each solar system, you know, mm. or in each uh, galaxy as well. I mean, think about the infiniteness of creation. If it is real, because a lot of my friends now are saying <laughs> that it's a fucking not real at all, that it's all it's water above. And you know, that's becoming actually a pretty popular viewpoint, you know, that with the the Earth being flat and having a firmament and that type of thing so (laughs) it's an interesting one to think about i don't know if we want to go into the flat earth rabbit hole or not (laughs) (laughs) i'll leave it up to you (laughs) (laughs) um i appreciate you bringing that up because i i actually think that is what we're here to do what we are here to like discover and question um and part one of the things that and i'm and this is what i mean by that the way that the i i i see myself as an expert on the shadow and the unconscious and healing and so the nature of the mind is such that right now collectively We have a collective shadow. We have um, collective trauma. And so what I'm navigating within myself right now, which I know simultaneously the collective is navigating because my mind is connected to the collective mind or the galactic mind that you talked about. And whatever shadow comes up in me, is in the collective shadow right now this is what it's meant by when you integrate yourself you're simultaneously integrating the world because your shadow my shadow is the same as the collective shadow it's all the same and so part of what i am uh, alchemizing within myself is the belief inside the collective shadow that god doesn't exist and the way that shows up is you have half of the planet trying to spend their lifetime prove that god doesn't exist and you have other half of the planet using their lifetime trying to prove that god does exist and so if that's the current landscape of our reality that shows on a very unconscious level we have a belief in the shadow that god doesn't exist which like i mentioned it's okay we're here to alchemize this same thing with the flat earth Same thing with space is not real. Same thing with this is the only life. Same thing with there is no soul. All of these things that are coming up are for us to alchemize and transmute within ourselves. Because that's the way through heaven. That's the way to heaven. And again, we, we can get into that, but my definition of heaven is a state of consciousness. Heaven is a perception. Being able to see a certain way is heaven um, in this physical realm but yeah in regards to um all the conspiracies and things coming up and 
there is like one world power that is controlling everything and all, all of this is a normal part of the process of where we are at as humans and where we are being asked to go collectively and these aspects of the shadow are must come up because energy must play itself out in order for true alchemization in heaven to exist so how do you see the shadow of loneliness as a man that's a that's that's a big one that's one that i'm also alchemizing within myself um the and this hit me a couple of days ago in my stretch actually in the morning that the shadow although it feels real it is not real like even in its essence when we think of a shadow we can see it but it's not real right it's just the absence of light the only way that a shadow exists if there if there's something blocking light and so the shadow or the unconscious or trauma stuck in the body these are all the same different words for the same thing um it feels very real inside the body that is real the story that this feeling is saying is not that's the way that i see it the the pain and the grief of me feeling lonely is very real but the story the thought that this feeling is saying is not because every cell of my body is interacting with this physical universe every molecule and atom of my body is in communication with the earth with the moon with the sun with the grass with you right now but that feeling of loneliness inside of myself that grief and that pain and that fear is blocking that ability to really feel that you know and so it's really important the way that i see it is it's it's important to validate that feeling to normalize that feeling that yes it's real and the story that it's telling me is not because in reality i am not i'm i'm interconnected with everything it's just that part of my shadow and i'm putting air quotes as part of my conditioning and beliefs that is making me think and believe otherwise So loneliness is the absence of the light of the truth, in a sense. And so transcending that loneliness, what do you think the, the move is? Have you heard the Have you heard the Golden Buddha story? Uh, the Buddha statue story. Maybe, but tell it again. So essentially, the shadow work and transmuting and alchemizing it's all about removing you know it's so interesting when we talk about healing and we think about healing the first thing that we do is like what do, what do i got to do what what action do i got to take what do i need to learn and add in order for me to like transcend the loneliness but in essence it's a lot of taking off it's a lot of unlearning it's a lot of removing and so the Buddha statue story is goes the, the way that it goes is that way back in the day in one of the villages they had a golden Buddha statue about like the size of my face the size of my head and uh, the monks of that village they hear that there are um there are uh, thieves going around from village to village. And so the only valuable thing that they could think of is this golden Buddha statue, which is like made of pure gold inside and out. And so what they think of to do is they cover this statue with mud and poop and all sorts of like um, 
unpleasant things and they cover it up. And when the thieves come, they obviously don't go near that thing. They don't go near the poop. They don't go near the mud. And the essence of the story is that we are all that golden Buddha statue. We are all that inside and out gold. And we're covered up with stuff. <laughs> we're covered up with mud. We're covered up with dirt and dust. And essentially, the work is removing that, cleaning that. And in other words, letting go of what we hold so dear to be true. Letting go of what we are holding so close to our hearts as this is the truth. And by that, I mean, we, we hold a lot of our beliefs as, as the truth. You know, like, I'm, nobody loves me. I'm lonely. These are very deep, deep in the collective unconscious. It's all about letting those go. And we let them go by getting into the body and feeling those feelings. We alchemize through feeling those feelings. And so the, re the, the, the reason why these thoughts and these stories and these conditionings are so powerful is because there's a lot of emotions backing them up in the body. And so going into the body, acknowledging those feelings, naming those feelings, feeling those feelings, they weaken these stories. They naturally weaken the thoughts. They naturally weaken these beliefs. And through this process, you, not, you naturally come back to the truth. You naturally come back to yourself. So it, in essence, it's a, it's a um, path of forgetting. <laughs> you know, we've, a lot of people including Brother Eisen, it's, it's a path of remembrance. But I like to think of it as a path of forget, forgetting a lot of these things that I've held to be true. And um, have, are you familiar with Sufism? A little bit, but not that much. Yeah, so me from, being from Iran, and I have a lot of ties to Sufism. And although I don't practice it, but I've had a lot of Sufi greats and masters come into my dreams. And the way that they started to see this reality, the way that they put it in, into words is they saw God as that intelligence that is here uncovering that dirt and gunk off of them. They saw God and the pain that comes, the discomfort that comes, the calamities, the tragedies. Everything that is happening in the world is happening in perfect order because this intelligence is here washing that gunk and that dirt off of you. And they put it in that poetic sense. So do you think that that ties into karma at all with... If, if you're alleviating karma, maybe from past, I don't even know if you think karma is legit. Well, that's probably a good question. Too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that's what that made me think of that. If do we have karma and if we are letting go of that karma, is that the cleaning? So to mm. speak? Good question. The way that I see karma is a little bit different than what the current understanding in the collective is right now in regards to karma. The way that I see karma is another, karma is another word for shadow. Karma is another word for the unconscious. And so, essentially, the mechanism of the shadow or the unconscious or the karma is that something happened, let's say in this, in this conversation, you are like, you 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 would tell me, hey man, everything you're saying is a joke. You know, you're you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm I'm wasting my time here. Everything that you've shared in the last hour is a complete joke. Okay, you let's say you say that. The way I perceive what you just said, or the meaning I place on what you just said, is my karma. Meaning, if I, if I, if you were said that, and I, my reaction 
what to this would be like, oh man, that's messed up. Like, I can't believe he said, he said that. I, I, I thought we were cool. I thought we were having a good conversation. The feelings that arise there, that's my karma. That is the shadow. That is the reaction that comes post-perception. After the meaning that I place on what just happened. And this is the power that we have. A lot, we, we, we right now, the karma of the collective, I'm going to use the word karma or the shadow. The karma of the collective right now is we're trying to control the external environment to bring safety within, to bring peace within. We're trying to control what other people say and how other people view us and how other people um, treat us in order for me to feel better about myself. That's the collective karma. It's kind of like we want to um, create a red carpet for the entire planet. We want to create softness for the entire planet. And the way that I see it is that I'm going to create a red carpet and, and the soft, softness in the soles of my shoes so that wherever I go, I feel soft within myself. I feel comfortable within myself. And so that's the way that I see karma. Karma is um, something that is in me. And we can get into uh, what, how I see reincarnation and past lives and things like that. But we now know through research that trauma gets handed down through our genes. What my grandfather went through, I'm, I'm feeling it inside of myself. And so I have a, th that's, that's the way that I see karma. Not something that I did something in the past and I must pay for it now. Do you think that that exists though or no? Well, when we, I think it's really also important to uh, bring this into the conversation. When we experience reality, or what we call as our life, we're experiencing it inside of ourselves, right? When we eat, when we feel joy, when we feel angry, when we feel fear, love, peace, all of that, we're feeling it inside of ourselves. It's feeling, we're feeling that inside, within. And so I think it's really important to distinguish reality and what reality is, is reality is inside of you. You're experiencing it inside of you. And so this whole notion that if I do something good, something good happens. Or if I do something bad, something bad happens. The premise of that, again, it goes into something on the outside determines how I feel on the inside. You see? Again, it goes back to trying to control and manipulate something on the outside so my experience within can be pleasant. And so the way that I see it is, if my experience of reality is happening inside of me, and I know that the world doesn't happen my way, what happens inside of me must happen 100% my way. You're saying it must happen my way. What do you mean by that? I cannot control what happens in the world. But I can create what happens inside of me in respect to what happens in the world or in my life. And I think that's where our power lives in being able to be joyful regardless. Being able to be peaceful regardless. And... I think that's where we can reclaim a lot of, pow of our power back when we understand that we create whatever we can create within ourselves and we don't really need the outside world like we think we do right now. Then the question is, is does being in peace no matter what create peaceful circumstances? <laughs> <sighs> well, in order to get to peace, we need chaos. Because right now, and this, this gets into nervous system work. This gets into body somatic work. Because um, what we think of to be peace right now is we've created our own little comfort zones. 
We've created our own little bubbles in our own individual lives. And anything that is remotely triggering or activating, we run away from to protect peace. You know, you hear that a lot. Protect your peace. Protect your peace. Any peace that needs to be protected is no peace. Because peace is, is the protector. And so, in order to find peace, you must seek chaos. You must seek disharmony. Why? Because your nervous system, your body right now is programmed to uh, only, um, only pick, up, pick certain things as peaceful. Um, it's, it's programmed that to uh, pick this as desirable and pick this as undesirable. And it, it picks the desirable as peace, picks the undesirable as chaos. And so in order to truly find peace within, in order to really be comfortable in your own skin, and I just that just rhymed, <laughs> um, we must seek this harmony. Like, for example, man, I was, I was scared and nervous to come on this podcast. I was scared and nervous. I did a live this morning and I led meditation. Why? Because my body is does not does not see see that as desirable my body does not see that as peace and because the body does not have the intelligence to discern that's what the conscious mind does the subconscious mind does not have the ability to discern it's just the programming that runs um we we have to seek this harmony in order to find harmony we have to seek a chaos in order to find peace because it's all about reprogramming the body it's all about um living where we fear to live do you still feel nervous you feel all right <laughs> no i feel uh <laughs> um after about a couple of minutes then my body my body felt safe that it's here my body felt calm my body felt relaxed because before it was it thought you know the body thought that it was gonna be threatened and attacked but now it's like no it feels safe in here it feels safe to be heard and to be seen and to speak the, and this is this is how we reprogram we do it in action because you can do all of the mindset work and all the thought work but if you're not actively reprogramming in action then it doesn't really work and this is why relationships are so profound and powerful in bringing harmony and peace to the planet because it forces you to constantly be doing the work <laughs> yes if, and um or break you, up that is me. Huh? or break, or break up, up. <laughs> yeah that's yeah, always an option and um yeah in in relationships you're able to let the body know that it's safe in places that it previously thought it would be very unsafe Hey, if you're getting value from the podcast, if you don't mind dropping a nice five-star review, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that would be incredibly beneficial to the podcast and what we're doing here on The Human Game. And I'll greatly, greatly appreciate that and any and all support as we keep going here, if we keep trucking. And as far as if you're on YouTube, if you don't mind just dropping a like and let me know what you think of the podcast down below, what's coming through for you when you're listening. So. I greatly appreciate, again, all the support. And let's get back into it. I think of this quote that I heard one time about relationships. It being about not seeking a partner that, like, has the physical qualities they're looking for necessarily first, but rather someone you feel safe to process with. Mm. Someone you feel safe to elevate with and that will understand that you're not perfect and you're going through shit. Um, mm. And that you're doing the best to do your own inner work as you progress in life and in this relationship and that you're not going to be perfect because there's been times in my life where I felt like sometimes, I don't know how it is as a woman, but as a man, you can be held to a standard of perfection and not having any room by certain women for error and for just the trial process of life and letting go of your own shadow. And I think mm -hmm. what you're saying is profound, that 
the relationship can be a huge catalyst for growth. And I think that being alone can be a huge catalyst for growth. And I think mm-hmm. there's really just seasons, right? For me, I'm in the season of my life where I've been by myself with, with my golden retriever, Jack Sears, and <laughs> July. Yeah. So it's December now. So about six months. And I don't feel like I really got to my own shit. I was able to get through to myself until probably four months in of being alone. And I realized Mm. how much I needed that because I was constantly blaming someone else, not necessarily like outwardly blaming, but like the little things I can't do this because of that or this. It's just like these little subtle mind tricks that I was playing on myself. And Mm. it wasn't until I was alone that I was able to address that. And I feel like as I did that, then I'll probably progress into a relationship and experience more of what you're talking about, you know, where it's, Brother, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you got cut off after alone. Okay, give me the sentence because I don't remember. You've been it. alone for six months. Okay. I wonder if this is going to show up on the recording because. Well, oh, maybe it's just on my end. No, it's it's on my end too, but I, I wonder if it's just because of the connection, but it's the recording locally, so it won't show up mm. for people. So if we're repeating, that's prob- that's why. It's not intentional at all but um yeah so essentially i just spent a lot of time alone and i was able to see my shit after spending enough time alone Mm. and i feel like then there's just a level of i'm okay alone which is a huge thing that i think people underestimate (laughs) that they're able to handle especially those relationships Mm -hmm. because i realized how much i have been in relationships because i just didn't want to be alone Mm. and when i truly sat with myself for these last six months and was alone and i'm finally comfortable being alone i actually enjoy my own presence a lot without having to do shit i mean i did to a certain respect but you know this is the honest truth and mm-hmm. i think a lot of people feel this way have felt this way before and so i feel like then the next level is then there's probably going to be a relationship that comes in and I'm probably going to get mm-hmm. triggered in different ways that I couldn't be triggered. It's just like a different level of the game, not a higher or lower level necessarily, just a different way to play it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's powerful, man. That's powerful. And I love that brush that you brought that up because we're all in different seasons. We're all on our own unique journeys. Everything is happening in perfect order. And in my own relationship, man, it's been a been a war zone for triggers and insecurities and fears. And I too have this really deep terror of ending of being left and being an abandoned. And so that's showing up over and over again in my relationship. And what I'm realizing and seeing is that um and this this may be just for me. Other people may be different, but I would not be able to truly alchemize this outside of a relationship. I need, I need to be in a partnership, in a union, in order for this aspect of me, for this aspect of my identity to be let go and to be alchemized in a relationship, which is counterintuitive, but that is how I'm seeing this path. That's interesting. Because for me, it was needing to be alone to realize it's not that bad. (laughs) (laughs) And that I actually enjoy my own company once I do the do the self contemplation. And it's Mm. it's basically what you've been saying throughout this entire episode. It's been about the shadow for me turning and facing the shadow. Only I Mm. can do that. There's different Mm. ways that we can have others to help facilitate that. But at the end of the day, it's all about turning and facing it. And for me, it's been Mm. turning and facing it, seeing it's not that bad. For example, another way that this shows up is I went on a run this morning. I did not run a fast mile. I'll tell you that. (laughs) It was nice and slow, but it's progression. And I used to fucking hate running. But I, when I turn and I face the shadow of something I... I'm uncomfortable doing then it's like it's not that bad 
-hmm. And so then it's like, for me, it was turning towards those aversions, looking at them dead in the face and go moving towards them in that direction. And then they don't no longer become aversions. But in another point that you made was that same thing. You said it mm -hmm. in a different way, but it's like rewiring your mind to want to do the difficult things on purpose because of the fulfillment, at least this for me, of the fulfillment it gives me in doing them. Not necessarily mm -hmm. a comparison of better than, but it, it's, a, it's a sense of basically the neuroscience of long-term gratification versus short-term mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. I really like what you said. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. And that is, that's literally the intelligence of the body. Because what's happening is that the body thinks that something terrible is going to happen when you do that, when you face the shadow. But when you face it, and the body relaxes, it's like, oh, it wasn't that bad. It's not as bad as I thought I, it was. And there you find freedom. There you find relief. There you find peace. There you find joy, which essentially isn't that all what we are looking for at the end of the day. I, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny, though, is when I was running, I ran two miles, I ran one there and back. I ran the second mile faster. And it's, you would think that you'd run the first faster, but it's like, that's what happened. What you're saying, the nervous system relaxed. It's like, okay, we got this. And mm -hmm. it was like, I had the fucking Avengers on the back. Did it, it, did it, did it, it, did it, did it, it. It felt so damn good. And mm. uh, I think that's one thing I've been really passionate about and a thing I've been sharing about a lot. And it's interesting that we're having this conversation at this time because it's so perfect because I've been talking a lot about self-mastery, the concept mm. of what self-mastery does and what that means. And I think this conversation has been very helpful for me to even kind of clear that up and get really clear on the languaging of it because what is it for? Why are you doing it? Are you inspired to do it? Are you forcing yourself to do it? Where are you at? Where is the different ways you can perceive self-mastery? Does it have to be a comparison game? Hmm. Or not? Does, can it be, this is just what I feel inspired to do? I almost feel like, it, for me, when I think about self-mastery, it literally is in one sentence, feeling like that's the... the uh, the music I'm here to do. Mm. Mm. It, it, it just feels like when I do that, when I stop avoiding it, every time that I do, everything works out. And, and it's crazy because every time I avoid it, everything goes to shit. And I think to me, that's a sign that there's something in it for me. And, and so I think that that does come into harmony with your definition in a sense because it's not about comparison. It's about when you're doing it, it feels inspiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what, what is the, and I don't want to, what, what, what is the definition that you've come up so far for self mastery? How would you describe that in, in your work and what you're coming across? Yeah, yeah, okay. So self-mastery to me is seeing the shadow aspects of self that lead to degeneration of the body, whether that be uh, gluttony and mm. the process, eating processed foods that deteriorate the body and seeing what the human form physically, spiritually, and mentally can be capable of by looking at these different, um, you could say mystics that have come in different mm. religions. Like what is Jesus, like what, what level of self-mastery has Jesus attained? What has Buddha attained? What has Krishna attained? What has Muhammad attained? And um, there's many more. 
Mm-hmm. And so I'm looking at those principles of how they lived, what did they do? And I'm emulating that in combination mm-hmm. with the science of nervous system regulation or mm-hmm. getting the neurochemistry of the body back into the present moment. And so for me, it's a long definition, but it's combining both the spiritual principles and the scientific mm. principles to reach the uh, a level of connectedness, interconnectedness of, to all things that I feel like is conducive to a healthy society and um, mm-hmm. an evolved human race and to kind of mm-hmm. lead that, if that makes sense, if I can. Mm. That's pretty profound, man. And I would say that you're already doing that. Thanks. With the work that you're doing with the podcast, with the way that you're showing up in the group chat and everything that you're, you being here right now and I'm, and us having this conversation that shows a lot of what you have already done so far. And so I would say that like, man, you're already doing it, bro. Thanks, man. Doing my best. I've had many times where I know I haven't reached my potential. And for me, it's been about like allowing those parts of me to be loved, but yet not rule. Like I made a video last night and it was about how I can love those shadow aspects of myself and integrate them and alchemize them. But part of that alchemization is to say, you're not going to be in control though of what the actions are, even if the actions are within. Because mm-hmm. internal actions are still actions or external actions. And so it's like the balancing. I guess that would be a, a quicker definition of self-mastery. But but how do you see it? That's the real question. <laughs> but the way I used to see it, um, the way I used to see it was I would pick some sort of abstract point in future and work my way through that, whether that's physically or in other domain of being a human, and um, work towards achieving that, you know? Um, And the way that the Sufis and the Hindus um, in the mystical traditions, the, the Tantra and the Sufi traditions, the way that they've been able to uh, identify the different uh, aspects of self. You spoke up on it. There's the physical aspect. There's the mental aspect, the emotional, and the spiritual or the energetic. And the the way that I used to think about self mastery was what what I can do for my body, for my mind, for my emotions, and for my spirit in order to get to a certain aspect get to a certain abstract point in the future that that I can call that I have mastered self, you know, so I can say that I have mastered myself. And and the way that I would see it would be um, looking at Jesus, looking at Muhammad, looking at Buddha, Krishna. And in my own case, because I grew up in a Baha'i family, the prophet that we as Baha'is receive teachings from, divine teachings from, his title is Baha'u'llah. And so he like these these figures would be the thing that I would want to look at emulating for myself. Um, but what's shifted is right now the way that I see it now, and I know it's going to continue to shift. Um, but the way that it is I see it now is just the realization and the awareness that I am I am the master of myself in a sense that. I create my own destiny and I decide my own fate. And just knowing that gives me, in the word, in the essence, master of myself. Because I like to understand concepts based on the word. And so if I am master of myself, what does that mean? And so just the realization that I create my destiny, I create my fate, that gave me the the sense of like, I'm, I'm mastering myself. I'm the master that gives command to self. And so 
That's the way that I'm seeing it right now. But is that man becoming God? To bring it back around. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the sense that if I radiate harmony, if I radiate forgiveness and peace, then in that moment, in space and time, then I have become God. If I if I have that template, you know, I like to think of that as template. And um, if I can bring that template in and embody that, then in that moment, I've become God. I've become my greater self. So do you think that there's a destiny that's, that's controllable by us? per se versus like the destiny that is do you think there's predestined things that's a great question so the the word for destiny in farsi mean is sarnevisht and sarnevisht literally translates to what's written on your head or what's written on your mind and so the way that the way I see destiny is that whatever is written in my mind or whatever I write in my mind, in the tablet of my mind, becomes my destiny. Or in other words, I become who I think I am. And so, that and predestination. Um, this is something that I've been playing around with and I've told to certain people and receive certain feedbacks, but through my study of the writings of Baha'u'llah, um, and um, these writings are late 1800s, and um, in, in his writings, what I've come to understand is that eventually all souls end up in heaven, or in other words, all souls reach perfect, perfection, completeness, wholeness. And so, the way that I understood that is that this whole thing in this physical realm of going to hell and heaven and things like that, it's it, everyone ends up there eventually. Everyone is destined to end up there. And so in this physical realm, the way that I see predestination and fate or predetermination and fate is there are certain laws that govern this physical reality. This law is if I plant a apple seed, I will get an apple tree. That is a law in this physical universe. I cannot plant an apple seed and get orange tree. <clears throat> and so predestination, predetermination is that apple seed Planted, becoming an apple tree. That's predetermination. That's predestination. And fate is the process of that seed becoming an apple tree. It's, it's in the fate of that apple seed to become an apple tree. And the space between that is destiny. And so, by law, is predetermined that all souls end up in heaven. And when that is planted, it is fate. By the word of God, this, been, this has been planted. And so it is fate that all souls will end up in heaven. The space between that is destiny. That's the way that I see it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that reminds me of this saying that we're all going to get to the North Pole. We start at the South Pole. And if we want to go here, we want to go uh, north a little bit, then go west and go south and go north. There's an infinite amount of potentials that we could take. But no matter what, we'll eventually all make our way back mm -hmm. to that. And I, I think that this applies to two things. It's that the, our... our destiny in this life particularly what i'm referring to is a more of a purpose as well mm. is there a fate or a destiny of our purpose what we're here to do and what you're hinting at which is the destiny to return to wholeness or to return to god in some sense 
-hmm. And I almost see it as there's a, we're like a cell in the body of God. And there's a particular thing that we can choose to express. We can choose to express that, which we came here to be that cell. If I'm a red blood cell, then that might be doing what Mm -hmm. red blood cell does. Or I can say to myself, Hey, I by the mind it wants to be a uh, a white blood cell or it wants to be a um whatever other cell I, I can't for some reason can't think of any right now but um the point being is that there's all these different types of cells mm-hmm. I think we cut off so I'll, I'll restart the there's all these different types of cells I'm meant to be a red blood cell or a particular one through that's literally what I am but the the free will is in realizing it or not. I don't have to realize that I am that. I can pretend to be something else, but when I do pretend to be something else, I will feel existentially like it's not for me, but I'm forcing myself to do it through the mind. And I think a large majority of what we've been saying has been Mm -hmm. that if you go within and you tap into what it is that you are, it will become natural through inspiration. Mm-hmm. As to what you are to do, you don't have to force yourself through the mind. This is what I should do. It will lead you to physical results in the same way, like you're saying. You plant a tree, it will grow into a tree. Physical law, yes, you will still get results. But that's why so many people feel disconnected from what they truly are. And I think that that's one of the biggest problems we have on the planet is feeling as mm-hmm. though we're not connected to everything else. And also to what mm-hmm. we are here to do, the the purpose of what the music is that's within us. And so it's mm-hmm. not necessarily a motivation problem because that's what you hear a lot of the times. It's, oh, motivational. Mm-hmm. No, 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 it's not that. It's the deeper sense. If you were connected to what you truly felt like was for you through that inspiration, you wouldn't need motivation because it would be beyond motivation to participate in it because it felt so damn good just to participate in it. Motivation doesn't exist when you're tapped into inspiration. So that's how I feel when it comes to this conversation of purpose or not. It's as though we have this, that we can choose to be it or we can choose not to be it, but we have the free will to do so. I do think eventually though, we will return back to, like you're saying, the souls will return back to that place that um, you could call it heaven. Mm-hmm. I kind of see in the game analogy, you know, the human game podcast, I see it more as uh, the uh, the temporary home of the soul. Mm. And in the re- I, the rebirth models, what I've taken here in the human game podcast, so it's where it's it's a home. It's where we may spend millions, billions of what we consider to be time. Mm -hmm. but it's not the ultimate reality it still is change but it might be slower change and then what you're saying is that there's another reality above that and then Mm -hmm. can we connect back to that and i think that a lot of these mystics even the mystic you're speaking on my intuition is that they've connected to beyond the soul even Mm -hmm. so so they're like skipping they're transcending a a level that most people are just trying to do the soul thing and they're like actually there's more than even that <laughs> Oof. Man, you're hitting on some beautiful points. Oof, brother. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> I lost you as soon as I fucking said it. I lost your face froze. Damn it. I don't know what the hell's going on with this call. Wow. Shit. And I'm I'm saying say that again because it was so profound, <laughs> not knowing that I actually missed out on what you said. <laughs> these the mystics of these traditions a lot of the times you're wondering why some some of these mystics or masters of these major religions some are speaking on the soul some are speaking above the soul what i mean by above the soul is that there's a reality that exists even beyond the soul journey the soul evolution and that with the rebirth model that we have like say in the hindu model would be that we have the reincarnation model we have the karma but that is telling us essentially the in-between that I feel like a lot of mystics don't even bother to go to the in-between. They're just like, yeah, why are we messing around with this? This is more small talk. (laughs) Mm. Let's Mm. get into what the ultimate (laughs) reality is, in a sense. And so that's, that's partly what I was saying.
that I think there's just there's levels to the game. And the soul is just oh. one level. That's human profound, is just one man. level. Yeah. That's profound. That's profound. And say that again around the inspiration and motivation and i can sense the fire in you coming on coming alive in that and man i'm totally with you on that and one thing that i would say in regards to with the profound truth that you just shared is in my own journey with these mystics there's been a sense of taking them off the pedestal and seeing them just as another man who walked a certain path. And that's also deep in the collective unconscious is pedestaling a human and worshiping that human as God. And even in my own case, the mystic that I happen to be doing that unconsciously is Baha'u'llah, the mystic that I talked about. And in my own process of letting that go, it's been a journey of understanding and seeing like you said we're all the different cells and organs of the same body and the mind or the eye is no more important than the mouth and the ear is no more important than the heart and the finger is no more important than the strand of hair and so i really like what you brought in in regards to these people and the messages that they brought and the truths that they were able to channel through them um there they were and just like you and me we're all part of the same body and it's been really my work of finding harmony with that rather than competing with that and feeling threatened with that which i think is going to be a big work for men on the planet right now in bringing the like eisen says the warrior king template that's right. That's right, man. Holy shit. We went a little bit longer than we had expected today. Hope you don't mind. And uh, one one comment I did want to make here as we close is, I don't have the book in front of me, but the, the what I said about the small talk thing, it's not meant to be an insult to the Hindu tradition at all. It's one of my favorites. And mm -hmm. I've studied this shit, this shit ton. And I meant, I, I think it's important to actually look at it from a different lens too when we talk about that. That Kriya Yoga, Yogananda, it's a science. So he literally mm -hmm. calls it the royal science of God realization. So if it's a science, what do we do with science? He, I remember in the Bhagavad Gita Yogananda translation, he's like, yes, this is another exhaustive list, but you need the list if you're going to break this down into a science. And so when you're breaking it down to a science, of course you're going to mention the soul realm because that's what the game that most people are playing right now is so i just want to make that clear um so much respect to those traditions as well but okay i've got one more question for you then the question being let's say that after i'm not trying to put this on you but let's say after this podcast immediately after you reached a sudden enlightenment and uh you decided to go off into a cave immediately and you're just like, oh shit, I'm not going to talk to any more humans ever again. Damn, this is the last time I'm going to get to say anything to, to any human. What? Okay, so if that's the case, what would be the message you would leave humanity with in this moment? It could be a sentence, it could be a paragraph, it could be as long as you'd like, as short as you'd like, but what's coming to you that you would say to humanity? Wow, what a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I would say. Oh. What I would leave humanity with 
with this that God has come to the earth. God is the one that is courting us and inviting us. It's no longer us going to God. God is coming to us. We're in that age now. And to seek, what I would say is to seek the nature of who you are. Explore the nature of who you are. You will not, you will not regret it. And there it is. Oh. We did it. Let's go, dude. Let's Thanks go. for coming on the podcast. Where can people find you? Um, what do you got going on? Anything in particular you want to chat about or or tell people about? Yeah, I'm in the thank you and thank you for having me on the podcast, man. It's it was so fun to, uh, speaking with you and thank you for the work that you do. It's, it's amazing. Uh what I'm working on right now is more around listening and trusting as to what God has for me. And I'm creating, um, I'm doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one work, but I'm starting to create containers for men and embodied uh, masculinity. And where people can find me is I recently got back on IG after Instagram after a long time. And they can find me at God embodied. And that's God to underscore embodied. and where that comes from is that that's what my name means in Farsi. Bhutan means God in body or God embodied. And you can find me that, uh, on an IG with that name. And what I'm really working on right now is bringing true masculinity, true patriarchy, a balanced man into society. And if you're, if you're a man that's looking to discover yourself, find yourself, love yourself, man, that's, that's one thing that as men, a lot of a lot of men don't know. I know I didn't know how to do, but if you're looking to love yourself, to accept yourself, to find peace with yourself, man, that's what I'm passionate about right now. And that's what I'm working towards right now is bringing love to our men. Nice. All right. All the links for that will be in the description, no matter if you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or if you're on YouTube. Check out the description. Go follow this man. Go check out what he's doing. If you're called to his work, for a fucking reason. Okay? So, other than that, I think that'll do it for today's episode. Thanks again for coming on, man. It was a blast. I really appreciated all the wisdom you dropped myself. Likewise, man. Likewise. I really appreciate you. Much love, brother. Hey, real quick before you go, don't forget to subscribe if you're listening slash watching on YouTube. And if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, follow the podcast. You know, maybe drop that five-star review. Very much appreciated. And we'll be back for plenty more episodes. I absolutely love doing the podcast. It's such a passion project of mine. And I'm so glad that so many of you have given me such great feedback because I get to do something I love. And at the same time, give value to other people. And I feel like that's the sweet, sweet nectar of life right there. All right. We'll see you in the next episode of The Human Game. And until then, peace.